Hello students, uh, in this opportunity we will discuss about foreign finance, investment and aid and the controversies and the opportunity of uh, that matter. As usual, you can find this material in chapter 14 in your uh, textbook. So let's begin. Uh, so uh, in terms of financing uh, development, you know, sometimes a country uh, will need help from another country and one of the choice for that is we can use foreign aid uh, or investment and of course uh, we will talk about the controversy about that matters uh, so let's begin with the international flow of financial resource so for the international finance uh, resource uh, basically we have three resource we have the investment uh, the private direct or portfolio investment and then we also have a remittance of earnings by international migrant my migrants sorry and then uh, we also have the public and private development assistance so aid is going to be uh, in here okay okay uh, let's talk about the investment first so investment can definitely help uh, countries development so one of the type of investment uh, mentioned in this chapter is the foreign direct investment it is uh, you have uh, you have learned about foreign direct investment in your macroeconomics course so one of the example is the multinational corporation so when an MNC invest or they open a branch uh, or they open a firm or they open a manufacturer uh, in a developing country so that's a type of foreign direct uh, investment uh, and then there has been a uh, recent growth in the fdi so like if you notice uh, for example apple uh, apple do their manufacturing uh, in china uh, in taiwan instead of uh, in the united states so that's an example of a foreign direct uh, investment it it's been, it's been uh, quite popular actually like for example some of the Japanese um, automobile industry I think they also have uh, some manufacturer in uh, Southeast Asia maybe in Indonesia in Thailand mm, I think uh, I think that's what happened so those are example of FDI ah, let's take a look at figure 14.1 here this is the trend of FDI inflows from 1980 to 2008. As you can see, the trend is positive. The trend is increasing. Um, okay, this is uh, billions of US dollar and this is time uh, from 80s to 2008. And then, um, okay, this is the FDI um, that uh, is done by the developing economies the developed economies and the transition economies but in total it's increasing okay and then the figure 14.2 the net capital flows to developing countries uh, yep so when there is an fdi of course uh, we will have net capital flows why because uh, we will build new building right at least new building and then there will be new technology new machinery so those are the type of capital uh, inflows so the net capital flows to developing countries due to foreign direct investment in 2000 and 2009 can be shown in the figure 14.2 so from the direct investment is the black line here and the portfolio investment is the blue here and the other capital flows is the dash, back, uh, dash black line and the official developmental assistance is the dash uh, blue line so apparently direct investment is still uh, the most popular because um, in terms of billions dollar it's higher uh, than the other oh uh, i have to mention in terms of foreign investment then we have two type we have the direct investment like the mnc uh, or new uh, manufacturer or something like that and then we also have the private portfolio uh, investment with the portfolio investment it's just um, like for example Indofood Indofood is owned by Indonesia right 
but then the foreign country like the US for example uh, they buy stocks nah, it's something uh, oh, sorry it illustrates the portfolio investment okay and then the the private foreign investment and the multinational corporation okay I think I have explained this to you. So basically, if there is a multinational corporation and they open new factory in the developing countries, uh, that's private foreign direct investment. Let's continue. So the private foreign uh, investment, uh, we have pros and cons, of course, for the development. Like anything, we, we, we will always have pros and cons. And the traditional arguments in support for the private investment yes it's going to filling savings uh, foreign exchange revenue and the management gaps this is the four main uh, arguments so the pros arguments is uh, when investment came of course we have mentioned before right saving equals investment then the national saving is going to increase uh, and then we will have a foreign exchange and then of course it will increase our revenue and the management gap so what does it mean with management gaps uh for a developing country uh they can learn a lot uh, from the mnc right so the knowledge gap uh, technological gap also management gaps it can be very beneficial because that way the developing country they can uh, they can gain benefit and then they can uh, better their quality in management, in technology, in human capital, uh, and other stuff. Okay, uh, these are the four main arguments. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, arguments against private foreign investment. Uh, the contrary arguments is the widening caps. Uh, what does it mean with the widening gaps well uh, so let's break it down uh, into this uh, components here so first of all uh, there are two main perspective of the arguments again uh, foreign direct investment uh, it's uh, in the terms of economic and ideological approach uh, in terms of ideological approach uh, uh, it, it's something like there is uh, some uh, ideological view uh, that when you uh, open up uh, yourself to the foreign, uh, they might take advantage of us, they might hurt our pride, we might not uh, consume our own product. So it has a lot with the nationalism uh, arguments, with the ideological approach. But with the economic approach, um, uh, there is... Uh, there is some concern uh, although mncs provide capital they may lower domestic savings and investment rates by substituting for private savings stifling competition through exclusive production agreement and then failing to reinvest much of their profits uh, in the developing countries and instead they will generate the incomes uh, abroad so we don't really get any economic benefit uh, from that and then there is also the, the argument of transfer pricing. Uh, what is transfer pricing? So uh, although the MNCs do contribute to public revenue in the form of corporate taxes and their contribution, uh, their contribution is, is considerably less than it might appear as a result of liberal tax concessions and the practice of transfer pricing. So transfer pricing is an accounting procedure often used to lower total tax paid by MNC um, and purchase of goods and services uh, are artificially invoiced so that the profit occurred to the branch office located in the developing countries, usually the low tax countries, uh, while office uh, in high tax countries uh, show little or no uh, taxable profits. So that's the transfer pricing. Basically, if you if you kind of get away uh, from the rules and regulation because of uh, accounting manipulation, so that you don't pay much tax in the developing countries and you can hide your profit from the developing uh, countries. So that's transfer 
pricing. Uh, so with all of those arguments, should we support or should we deny the FDI? Well, uh, there is no uh, one answer for that. So we have to reconcile the pros uh, and cons. Okay. Uh, and then the next one is uh, the portfolio investment. Is there a benefit and risk? Yep, definitely there's benefits uh, and risk. Um, in short, it's not very, it's not that different actually from the foreign direct investment. The benefits is also, uh, sorry, I mean the benefits is of course, there will be more uh, revenue, more finance that comes from the portfolio investment. But, but what are the risks? Of course, the risk because they own the stock of a national corporation. Then it means if they, uh, if they have, they will have power, uh, you know, to uh, direct or to quote unquote dictate how the national corporation should operate. And there is also risk, uh, risk if they just uh, suddenly throw away the stock or sell the stocks, then it might cause a mayhem, you know, in the uh, in the uh, portfolio uh, market. Uh, okay, so what is portfolio investment? Like I said, when they buy stocks uh, of the national corporation, I mean, if the foreign investors buy stock from the national corporation, okay, yeah, uh, it's stock in here. Uh, so stock market in emerging country is actually quite popular because the investors see that uh, a lot of corporation in emerging countries or in developing countries they have huge potential or even limitless potential so that's why they are willing to invest in the portfolio or in the stock okay okay the next one is the role of growth and remittance okay um in this uh part we will talk a lot about uh migrants worker or um, yeah migrants worker so uh, because of wage difference between the high economy and the low economy wage difference between developed countries and the developing countries so that's why a lot of workers uh, they want to work uh, in the developed countries where the wage uh, is higher uh, than their home right uh, so that's where the uh, that's where we're going to talk about uh, the growth of uh, remittance. Uh, what is remittance? Uh, if you don't know what remittance is, remittance is a non-commercial transfer of money by foreign worker um, or a citizen with family ties abroad for household income in their home country or homeland. So basically, if you work as a lawyer, uh, not as a lawyer, maybe as an engineer in the US, for example, and then you send your money back home to Indonesia, that's uh, remittance. Okay, um, is it a good thing uh, to work in other country and then send money home? Uh, we cannot say for for sure. I mean, it's case by case, right? But uh, I think uh, if someone can do that, it's it's not wrong. But the issue here is because because of the difference in the wage and the living condition between developing countries and developed countries, uh, the phenomena that we saw is a brain drain. So like, for example, uh, you go work uh, in the USA as an engineer and then you notice that, oh, living condition in the US is much better than in Indonesia. And then you're thinking, ah, maybe instead of I send money home, I can just stay here and have family there or maybe move your family from Indonesia there. And then what's going to happen is you're not going to be back to your home country and you are not going to contribute to the home country uh, in terms of uh, economic so you're going to stay there live there and then work there so that's a phenomena that we call brain drain okay uh, and then there is also uh, because of that uh, because a lot of people are going to work abroad and then uh, decide to uh, to settle down in there and not coming back to the country so there is an issue with the uneven flow of remittance so the flow of the worker that go abroad and the flow of the remittance that go to the home country uh, is uneven so that's the phenomena 
of the of uh, <laughs> that's the phenomena that is caused by the wage difference between developed countries and developing uh, countries okay uh, in the figure 14.3 you can see the source of external financing for developing countries from 1990 to 2008 okay the black one is the eight receive and the blue one is the remittance receive and then you can see that uh, the the growth of the remittance is actually not very high in in fact it's kind of stagnant in here uh, meanwhile the aid uh, is still higher than the remittance okay maybe that's uh, because of the brain drain so due to brain drain uh, people live uh, abroad and they don't come back so that's why the growth of the remittance is quite slow and then this is the major remittance receiving developing countries by the level of gdp share in 2008 so uh, if we going to order countries uh, by rank in terms of volume of remittance uh, or the volumes of migrant worker here in apparently uh, of course india is one of the highest um, the migrants remittance is about forty five thousand. Uh, but if we rank it by the share of gdp tajikistan is the highest and the remittance is about one thousand and seven hundred million dollar okay and then let's talk about foreign aid we will have a lot of debate with the foreign aid um, okay uh, let's talk about the conceptual and the measurement problem uh, okay so when we talk about uh, foreign aid uh, we kind of have a problem with the definition and the eh, i mean the concept and the measurement uh, problem um so uh, there are conceptual problems associated with the definition of foreign aid and there are measurement and conceptual problems in the calculation of actual development assistance flow so in particular three major problems arise in measuring aid uh, the first one we cannot simply add up the dollar values of grant and loans uh, each has different significance to both donor and recip and, and recipient uh, countries and then loans must be repaid and therefore cost the donor benefit uh, the recipient less than the nominal value of the loan itself so conceptually we should deflate or discount the dollar value of interest bearing loans before adding them to the value of outright grants and then the second one aid can be tied either by source or by project in either case, the real value of the aid is reduced because specified source is likely to be an expensive supplier or the project is not the highest priority. And then, um, finally, we always need to distinguish between the nominal and real value of foreign assistance. Aid flows are usually calculated at nominal levels and then to show a steady rise over time however when deflated for rising prices the actual real volume of aid from most donor countries declined substantially substantially uh, in recent decades despite uh, recent uh, uptick okay so that's the problem and then we have uh, something called official development assistance here or ODA so the concept and measurement is a problem and we have uh, ODA here. Uh, what is ODA? ODA is the net disbursement of loans or grants made on conce concessional terms by official agencies historically by high income member uh, countries to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development or OACD. Okay. Uh, so this is the development assistance net disbursement so let's see uh, this is the donor country high economy country we have canada denmark france germany uh, and others and this is their uh, development assistance uh, to the oecd i guess or the developing countries eh 
No, yeah, the developing country, sorry. And then let's take a look at 2002. This is the billion dollars that they uh, quote-unquote donate or spend. And those dollars in terms of their GNI is like, for example, for Canada, 2 billion US dollar is 0.28 percentage of uh, their GNI. Well, let's take a look at the most generous countries with the highest percentage of their GNI. Oh, apparently it's Denmark. Denmark is very generous because they spend uh, almost 90, actually more than 90%. Oh, sorry, I mean almost 10% of their GNI uh, on uh, development assistance. So that's, I think, the highest uh, among all of the countries in here. Okay. Okay, uh, move on. This is the official development assistance by region okay so i think this is the recipient in middle east and north africa uh, they re received 72 73 uh, us dollar per capita and then uh, in terms of gni around three thousand dollar per capita and then uh, as a share of GNI, it's almost 2%. Okay. Okay, let's talk about the debate. <laughs> we like to talk about the debate in this course. So why donors give aid? Of course, they will have political motivation. They also have economic motivation. Political, eco uh, political motivation is complex in this case. You might, uh, you might argue it's about power and everything. Uh, you can read. Uh, about the political motivation in your book but let's discuss about the economic motivation so the economic motivation of uh, development assistance is of course to help developing countries grow right and we want to narrow the gap between developing countries and uh, developed countries so we have to get models here and other criteria, so we have foreign exchange constraint, growth and saving, technical assistance, absorptive capacity, and economic motivation, and self-interest. Okay. So this is the two gap model, uh, the saving constraint. In this case, you will uh, notice this formula, where I smaller than F plus SY. I is the domestic investment, F is the amount of capital inflows, S, small s is the saving rate, and Y is the national income. Okay. And then now the two gap model, let's take a look at the foreign exchange constraint, where we have M1 subtract by M2 times I plus M2 times Y subtract by E smaller equals to F. Now, I here is the domestic investment similar to the previous one. F here is the amount of capital flows. E is the level of export. Y is the national income. M1 is the marginal import share. M2 is the marginal propensity to import. Okay. So uh, let's continue the debate. So there is a there is a reason why developing countries are willing to accept aid. Well, the very first and most important reason I can think about is because they need it. You know, like I said before, sometimes we want to we want to take action to support development, right? But we don't have resource, so that's why we need aid. So countries receive aid because they need it. That's the first and the most important reason. And then uh, the role of non-governmental organization uh, in AIDS. So uh, this has a lot to do when the government cannot provide uh, sufficient public goods or the government cannot, uh, cannot provide sufficient public goods. 
uh, in the remote area for example or they cannot have a policy that cover certain groups uh, or minority or something uh, that's where the NGO came and then NGO they need resource to right to uh, to do their job so sometimes the foreign aid they uh, they have agreement with the NGO so they will finance the NGO uh, to do their job so that's uh, another reason why sometimes the foreign aid come not through government but through NGOs and then the effects of aid you can argue all you want whether aids is good or bad but in some cases aid uh, actually have a uh, positive effects so like for example if you live in a country that is very very dry uh, and you need water but you do not have sanitation system and then there is an aid uh, from foreign country uh, that will build a sanitation system there then it will really help you so that's one of the positive effect of aid is there a negative effect of aid of course of course of course there is negative effect uh, of aid uh, like for example um sometimes uh, when aid games it's not always what the people need so like uh, for example uh, maybe what you need uh, is loan for a business you know to 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 help the village for example what they need is loan for business but what they give is education to do business so it's not very it's not very in line with what the people need so sometimes aid uh, can have negative effects sometimes aid can have positive effects and then there is conflict and development. Um, okay. Uh, in the in some developing countries, uh, there is conflict, uh, like in the Middle East, for example, or in the Africa, for example, uh, they have a conflict. So uh, it 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 will be a problem, right? Uh, for the uh, development economics because conflict uh, is not good and then uh, conflict can be dangerous in terms of the scope of the violent or the conflict risk the scope of the violent like for example if the war between uh, between between groups uh, they they uh, they are expanding and then they will reach like for example other city other province so that's uh, that's that's the reason why conflict is different uh, sorry <laughs> that's the reason why conflict is dangerous because of their scope and then there is also a conflict risk okay um, and then uh, the consequences of armed conflicts uh, they will affect health they will affect the destruction of wealth and worsening hunger and poverty loss of education and a turn of social fabric okay so those are the risks uh, of conflict and then this is the global trends in armed conflict from 90, 1946 to 2008 apparently in the 70s 80s and early 90s the conflict is really high in here but then the trend is going down okay and then these are the cause of armed conflict and the risk factor for conflict so uh, conflict can be caused by horizontal inequalities can be caused by natural resource for basic needs and also struggle to control exportable natural uh, resource And then for uh, for the resolution and prevention of armed conflict, uh, these are some of the things we can do. The first one is the importance of institution, for example, addressing commitment problems, and then global actors, and then regional actors, uh, national actors, focus on education, and also the local community-driven economic development. Okay. The example of everything in here, uh, you can read uh, in your book. Okay, uh, apparently those are the material for this chapter. These are some concepts that you can review. Uh, and this is the last chapter for this course. Uh, I hope 
you have fun uh, in this course and I hope uh, you will ace uh, your exams. Okay, uh, see you next time.